a huge subject, and, uh, and well, she's not a subject, is it really? It's a discipline for a lifetime. We don't have a lifetime. We now have 43 odd minutes to be able to dive into some aspects of this discipline for a lifetime, and obviously we can't grab it all. Even over two days, we can't. I thought in my uh, time today, though, I would focus my remarks on two parts of leadership, two aspects. One, I want to offer you a piece of data. Sorry, but as that video describes, I'm kind of a data head. So I want to show you some data on basically what do the best team leaders get done. What's the data tell us about what the best team leaders actually get done? And then second, I want to share with you a tool, tease apart that tool on how to pinpoint what your particular strengths are as a leader. So one piece of data on what the outcomes of a leader are, the outputs of a leader, and one tool to help you know what your inputs might be as a leader. All right, is that okay? One piece of data on outputs, one piece of data on inputs. Is that good? Yeah. Awesome. All right, here's, here's the data. I'm in the fortunate position of going into company after company after company all the time and measuring performance company after company. And when you do this again and again and again, you always find the same thing which I don't read in the business press very much at all, but you always find this. You find range in performance, not between two companies. You find range in performance between two teams in the same company doing exactly the same kind of work. Huge range. Let me give you one example. This is actually a retailer. You would all know who they are. I am not going to tell you their name. They have 8,000 stores here in the US, and, and they're one of the most respected retailers. One could argue they're one of the most respected companies in, in the world. And when you go into this company, one of their theories as a retailer, it's radical, is that the more affluent the community where we put the store, the more money that store should make. It's not radical. It's called citing. Where you put the store, cite the store, is kind of important. And when you plot out all the stores themselves on a graph, you get something that looks a little like this. Can I have those, those slides up so I can show that? So I can show that graph. Here's the graph. Local economic potential on the X. You've got profit up the Y. You plot them all out, all 8,000 of them, and you get this beautiful red line going from bottom left to top right. So if you were the CEO, the head leader, if you will, of this company, you look at that line and you go, good, there is true. More affluent the community, the more money the store makes. We should probably put the stores on the right-hand edge of that graph. But then you plot out the stores themselves, guys. You plot out the actual stores themselves, and you get this. You get the Milky Way. You, you, you've got a store down here at the bottom that's making, frankly, an awful lot less money than you would have thought it would make, given where you put it. And then let your eye go north, not east-west. Let your eye go north. Just go up, and you'll see there's a store like this one right here that has almost exactly the same economic potential as the one at the bottom. It's just making a lot more money. Now, I don't know what wakes you up at night, but one of the things that wakes me up at night is wondering what the heck is going on in the blue dot at the top that isn't going on in the blue dot at the bottom. I don't have a particularly interesting life, but I think that's a meaningfully interesting question, isn't it? Why do two teams in the same company, by the way, these people are paid in the same way, trained in the same way, selling the same products, the same kinds of customers. This company has one stock price. It's a pretty good stock price. Supposedly, it has one culture. And oh, by the way, what a lovely story that makes. One culture leads to one stock price. That just makes a good narrative. It's a fiction, guys. It's a fiction in every company. No one company has one culture. They have, if they're publicly traded, one stock price. But Google doesn't have one culture any more than Goldman Sachs has one culture. No company has one culture. You go inside a company that supposedly has one culture, and you find this. This company's got one of the most distinctive cultures in the world, but it doesn't have one culture. It has as many cultures as it does local work teams. What this shows us more clearly than ever before, I suppose, is that the strength of any particular company's culture is in the hands of the local leader. It's the local leader that makes the difference, right? Yes, there's something you can do from the center. For those of you who run big companies, you can do something from the center in terms, of, in terms of saying, this is what we value, or in terms of saying, this is what our strategy is, or in terms of saying, this is where we'll allocate our resources. You can do that, and that's great. But how those messages get communicated, how they actually get turned into the day-to-day -day reality of what it's like to go work in this place, that is hugely mediated by the behavior, the challenges, the performance of the local leader. 
There's no such thing as a great company. There's such a thing as a great stock price. But there's no such thing as a great company. All you can say about a great company or a great organization is it's a deliberate accumulation of lots and lots and lots of blue dots above the red line. So if you want to grow as a leader, and I imagine you're here because you want to grow as a leader, then you better have a theory. I don't mean a grand theory of leadership. I mean you better have a theory of why two teams in the same company have such differential levels of performance, when so much of it is due to the person who's running that blue dot at the top. And for those of you not following along, the blue dots are actually stores. They're not dots. <laughs> I mean, they are dots. I mean, they are dots. <laughs> but you've got 100 people working there, and I'm sure you've had an experience like that, haven't you? You've worked in that blue dot at the bottom. You've worked in a team where you did not feel engaged. You did not feel at your best. You did not feel inspired. You didn't. And then something happened. It might have happened slowly, or it might have happened, sometimes it happens quite quickly, doesn't it? A new client, a new project, a new colleague, a new leader, and suddenly you wake up, and you're in that blue dot at the top. You're on fire. You're at your very best, and your business card reads exactly the same. So you've had this experience. You've had an experience where you were disengaged, and then you've had one where you're at the summit of your own experience, but you didn't change companies. Something happened locally. In a sense, what we have to say from these data is that all company cultures are local, guys. They're all local. At least all the really important parts are local. So what goes on up there that doesn't go on down there? We could answer that question from your own experience. You could dive into your own experience and just noodle on what that was like for you. But I'm going to share with you some data on how to provide an answer for that. It's my background, so I'm not saying data explains everything. But it can give us a clue. While I was at Gallup, what we did is we asked people in the teams at the top a whole bunch of employee survey questions, and then we asked the people in the bottom the same questions. Millions of them, because we had the wherewithal to do that. And then we ditched. We ditched all the questions where the people in the best teams and the people in the least productive teams, where everyone strongly agreed. We just ditched them. Even if we loved the questions, oh, it's a question on vision or values or recognition or, or growth. Or, even if we loved the question, if it didn't seem to show any relationship, between high performing and low performing, we ditched it. And in the end, guys, after about 12 years of research, by the way, Gallup published the least, I mean, the most recent version of this in 2013, in June, for those of you that are into this stuff. Turns out three questions. Three questions explain a little north of 90% of the variation of every other question. So if you want to ask a 100 question employee survey, you can. It's just that you don't need to ask 97 of them. Here are three, the three most powerful questions, which if you think about it, do a pretty darn good job of capturing what do the best leaders get done. Now, we could dive into every one of them in great depth. I'll just give you a, a flavor because they give you a sense, I think, of what a leader should focus on. Here are the three, in ascending order. So when somebody says to you, what does the person in the blue dot at the top actually get done? These three questions capture pretty much all of it. And they're not necessarily what you would expect. Maybe, maybe they will be. I don't know what's going on in your head right now. The, th the third most powerful one is this one. Are my colleagues committed to quality work? Are my colleagues committed to quality? Gosh, that small word quality is huge, isn't it, in leadership? What do the best leaders do? They bring excellence to life. On the best team, somehow the best leader has helped people to know, here, excellence is this. And they bring it to life through heroes and stories and rituals and the expressed values they shove on the walls, they, they vivify quality. What is it? Let's bring it to life. You think about one of the most quintessential leaders of the last 20 years, you'd have to say Steve Jobs is up there. And I know we use him for probably too many examples, but in this case, I think he fits. He was brilliant at bringing this to life for the folks at Apple, wasn't he? For Steve Jobs, quality was one word. Quality is beauty. Quality is beauty. All these beauty, what beauty it all coheres. This, this whole product is so beautiful and integrated. And, and even yet today, even though he's passed on, he still leaves that legacy of quality is beauty. That's why the hero right now of Apple isn't Tim Cook, it's Johnny Ive, the head designer. That's why he's in all the commercials. It's, oh, look how beautiful this is. And, and even yet today, you walk the hallways and say to the Apple employee, in every department of Apple, you say, who are you trying to serve? They all say the same thing, which you may have heard. I, first time I heard this phrase, I didn't know what they were talking about. They say, we, we're, we're all designed to serve people who are geeked out by lickable technology. 
And you hear that, when I first heard that, I thought, oh, uh, I misunderstood. They're trying to say likable technology. But you dive in and you go, no, 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 we, we're geeked out here to serve people who are so, ooh, so entranced by the fact that this software is integrated perfectly with this hardware and the bezel is only just this thick and it's ooh, so shiny that there are moments when you just want to reach out and just lick it. <laughs> and there are some of you in the room right now who have no idea what I'm talking about. And there's others of you that have done it, haven't you? <laughs> Setting a stoplight, you're just like, I'm just going to give it a quick lick because it's so beautiful. If you're not geeked out by that, don't go, don't go work for Apple, don't go shop for Apple. If you're geeked out by that, imagine how radical. Now, of course, we're like, yeah, duh, I mean, Apple, your quality, beauty, duh. But imagine how radical that was as the moment when they first said, you know what? We are set up just to serve people that are geeked out by how precious and beautiful that all is. In fact, what we'll do is we'll take the department in every consumer electronics store that they shove over to the back of the store, or maybe they even outsource it. We'll take that department, the, the customer help desk, and we'll put it right in the center of the store, and we'll put these really special people behind it that we'll call, them, we'll, call them, we'll call them geniuses. We'll call them geniuses. And what we'll say to the customers is, hey, look, if you're super lucky, I mean, if you're really lucky, and, and you make a reservation, then you might have the chance to come in into our store and talk to someone who's even more geeked out by lickable technology than you are about why the stuff you bought from us doesn't work anymore. <laughs> That's how rabid we are about quality is beauty. We're gonna, now of course we look at it, we go, yeah, genius bar, of course you have to. No, it was a radical claim about what quality is and he brought it to life in so many ways. Of course, the point here is not that he has the right answer. That's not the right answer. Quality is beauty, that's not what leaders should say. His answer is the right answer for him and his team. But you walk even, I don't know, a couple of miles down the street and you walk into Facebook's headquarters, they don't have one word for quality. They have three words for quality. At Facebook, whatever you think of the service, I mean, they've built a big organization with a really distinct environment. And their definition of quality is three words, speed to impact, speed to impact. The promise that Facebook makes to all of the people coming on board is, look, you join on Thursday, you write code on Friday, we'll ship it over the weekend, and a billion people will feel it on Monday. If you're geeked out by that, come work here. That's why all over the walls you see stuff saying, done is better than perfect. Can you imagine that at Apple? Be like, no, 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 P perfect is perfect. It isn't done until it's perfect. But at Facebook, it's done is better than perfect. There are other posters saying, move fast, break things. You walk into their offices, and gosh, it's a physical manifestation of speed. There's wires. I mean, you walk into the, the um, Apple headquarters, and it's the whole thing is, have you been there? Anyone been there? It's beautiful. Like, you don't want to touch anything. It's just like this huge version of an iPad. This is a building, a series of buildings that are all shiny. You kind of want to lick the walls. I mean, it's that beautiful. You walk into Facebook, and it's like they moved in yesterday. There's concrete everywhere. There's wires hanging down. There's, there's, there's keyboards all over the place here. And then all over, and, and you walk into the offices, and the offices are Now, they have some offices. It's all open plan, but there are some offices for meetings and so on. And they've got glass doors. And on the glass doors, there's a logo which says Sun Microsystems. And you're like, oh, I came into the room. I came to the wrong building. <laughs> oh, then you think, oh, maybe it's art. Maybe it's like an Andy Warhol version of modern art on the walls or something. And they're like, no, no, it's, it's just those were the doors in the building because we bought the Sun Microsystems <laughs> building and we left the doors up. And I'm like, well, you know you can take them down, right? You know you can take them off and like, get new doors. Yeah, but we wanted to tell everyone that, you know what, in our business, things move really fast. Things move so fast. A huge company that's at the peak of the hill last month, last year, could be gone, like Sun Microsystems, gone in a heartbeat. We want everybody to see that this is a really fast-moving industry, and you better move fast, and if, you're, if your platform isn't burning, set it on fire right now, otherwise you'll go the way of Sun Microsystems. Okay, that is a beautiful, clear, vivid way of saying, when you come to work here, quality is speed. Quality is speed. So my point, of course, isn't that there's one right definition to quality. The point is that I need to join, if I'm on a great team, I've joined a team where the team leader is going, hey, Quality is this. There's a million dashboards. We can measure anything. But quality is this. If your people can't answer strongly agree to that question, you're not going to build a blue dot at the top. What are you doing? What are your rituals? What are your expressed values? What does the physical layout of your offices tell me as a new team member about what quality is in your place of work? Who are your heroes? What stories are you telling? 
pull those levers deliberately, otherwise you'll just be pulling them accidentally. Uh, so that's question number three. Question number two, second most powerful question. This is obvious. <laughs> Do I know what's expected of me at work? Apparently we like that. Apparently we like to know what's expected of us. I won't say a lot on this one except to say that it's weird that although this is a crashing glimpse of the obvious for any good leader in the room, the way that we choose to manage it at work is completely out of cadence with the way that it's felt as a team member. As you know, as a team member, many of you are leaders and team members, you know that the goals that were set for you or that you set with your leader at the beginning of Q1 were irrelevant by the third week of Q1, weren't they? I mean, things move really fast. You can sit down and noodle on your goals for 2014, but come the third week of 2014, things have changed, things have adjusted, and you are tweaking and adjusting and course correcting and coaching each, in real time, you're just adjusting all the time. And yet what we do with performance management, who's got a performance management or a performance appraisal system where we set the goals at Q1, we maybe check in with them six months later, and then maybe we come back at the end of the year and you get a rating. Okay, if I was to make one prediction today, it would be that all of the existing performance appraisal systems that most of us currently use, set goals at the beginning of the year, come back at the end of the year, fast forward two years, they're all gone. They're all gone. They're too infrequent. They're too retrospective. They're too out of sequence with what the best team leaders actually do in regards to expectations. If I was to say what's the one ritual that separates the best team leaders from the rest, it's this. Check in with each of your people once a week on two questions. What are you doing? How can I help you? What are you doing? How can I help? What are you doing? How can I help? What are you doing? How can I help? Times that by 52 and you get leadership. I mean, I'm sorry, that's so obvious, isn't it? It's so banal. We forget it. We do team meetings. Okay, once a week, team huddle. Okay, th yes, that's good. But really what I want as an individual, I want you to check in with me and say, what are you working on this week and how can I help? And I want you to do that every week because it changes every week. Even on jobs that are supposedly the same thing, Time after time, there's small but important changes in focus or attention or emphasis. I want you to check in with me every darn week so that in fact, performance and focus around expectations is much more like Twitter than it is like these once a year performance appraisals. Here's the point for us that we can learn from leaders. Expectations happen in real time. Don't try to manage them in a way that's batched. And right now we do. And if you're not into that, if you don't want to check in with your people every, every week because it feels like too much, then that's fine. Don't worry. <coughs> don't lead. <laughs> that's leading. That's not in addition to leading. That's leading. That's all it is. Who are you? What are you focused on? How can I help? That's leading. At least according to those being uh, led. Here's the number one most powerful question, though, which, by the way, explains 82% of the variance of the other two. So if you just had one question, you said, here's the one, qu what one question would you use to try and figure out who's building a blue dot at the top versus one at the bottom? What's the one most defining characteristic of great teams? It's this one, guys. At work, do I have a chance to do what I do best every day? At work, do I have a chance to do what I do best every day? It turns out that although we all should be cultivating servant leadership in ourselves and others, it turns out that that begins with you understanding who you are as a servant. I'm most interested in myself, not because I'm selfish, but because if I'm gonna make a contribution, it has to be from an understanding of where I'm at my best. Somehow on the best team, somehow, the best team leaders have cut through all the clutter and said, where are you at your best? Where are you at your best? How can I put you in a role where you're at your best? And you, on the receiving end of that, you feel like, gosh, he's interested in where I've got some kind of comparative advantage. And although not every part of my job fits into that, the everyday part's kind of important. I would say more than kind of, because if you take the word everyday out of that question, because you go, oh, who can do that every day? If I play to my best once a month, it's a good month. Because if you think that's real or that's reality, Maybe, but if you take the word every day out of that question, who strongly agrees and who doesn't seems to show no relationship to business outcomes of the team. So the everyday feeling of, gosh, I'm sort of in a role that gets the best of me every day, not all day every day, but every day, the everydayness is a really important part of what it takes to build a great, uh, build a great team. Now, 
It's not easy to do that. If you're a team leader or a team member, it's not always that you've got that kind of close relationship with your team leader. It, where human beings are complicated, and we sometimes, we don't, we don't sometimes get along with one another. You look at your team leader and you go, you, you, you deplete me. You do. <laughs> I walk in strong with my strengths and you shrink me. You're a shrinker. You're a, that's what you do. You're a shrinker. We should stop doing that. But you don't. So it's, it's not easy to get people to strongly agree to that first question. But if you want to think about what is the essence of leadership, it begins with curiosity. Leadership's curiosity, as in, who the heck are you? And who the heck are you? And how can I help you leverage your best? So putting all this together, what do the best leaders get done? Know me for what I do best. Focus me around what I do best. Surround me with like-valued people, and I'll win. Know me for what I do best. Focus me around what I do best. Surround me with people who define quality the way I do, and we will build a winning team together. Now, you're going to hear a lot more subtleties and aspects of leadership over the next few days. But if you wanted to come back to the data and you get confused because you're so busy and you're running so fast and you're thinking, what does it take to lead? Flip your head around. Get your head in the mind of the people being led. And remember those three most basic needs. Know me for what I do best. Please focus me every week around that and then surround me somehow. Bring to life for me the fact that we're surrounded by people who share my values. That's leadership in sports, in music, in business, in non-for-profit, whatever your focus is. That's the essence of leadership. Now there's more, but that's the essence from the perspective of those being led. Is that okay? Super, okay. I said one piece of data which can look at leaders from the perspective of the led, and then one tool to help you figure out perhaps what your particular strengths are as a leader. So here's the, here's the tool, and we've made available keys so that every one of you can take this tool if you're so inclined or intrigued. Um, this is called Standout, and as, as some of you know, I, with my colleague Don Clifton, we built something called Strength Finder, which was a bit like Myers-Briggs, a bit like DISC. Strength Finder was all about how you can how you can describe the best of yourself. It was a self-affirmation assessment, give you a language to describe the best of you. And I hope, for those of you that have ever taken it, very useful. With Standout, we want to do something different. There's an awful lot of different techniques and ideas on the left here of, of how leaders should be able to lead, but not all of them fit you. Have you ever seen a leader try to take on board a technique of someone that doesn't really fit their style and they turn out to be sort of Franken-leader? And you're like, who are you this week? I don't the, all, all the authenticity, which is the most valuable commodity you can have as a leader, right? Authenticity. All of that flies out the window as you try to take on board somebody else's ritual or technique. I mean, if you look at Tim Cook trying to do one of those Steve Jobsian presentations of a new iPhone or iPad, and you go, ah, oh, that's Tim, that's not you, man. I don't know who that is, but don't do that. <laughs> it, it's funny to see somebody try to take on board someone else's leadership style. It doesn't work well. So of all these different techniques and ideas, I wanted to create a, a filter to help you go, let's not give you everything and have you drink from a fire hose. Instead, let's just give you a few tips and techniques and ideas that fit you. Let's figure out your strengths algorithm as a leader and then deliver to you tips and techniques and ideas that fit, that fit you. So all of you can take this if you'd, if you'd like. It's going to measure you. I don't think I'm going to give the game away and explain this. It's going to measure you on these nine. It's going to measure you on these nine strengths roles, and it's going to show you your top two. Now, let me, just, let me just explain a couple of these for you so that you can understand what I'm getting at. If you're an advisor, your first question in any situation is always, what is the best thing to do? You are practical. You're pragmatic. You're not at the 50,000-foot level. You're at the 10-foot level. You're the sort of person who is always out there in front of the world dealing with the problems that people encounter, and people love you for that. Because when there's problems, you're not hidden. You're out there going, all right, here's what we should do. You're opinionated. You're bossy. Some of you are bossy. Hey, deal with it. You are. You're invigorated by solving other people's problems. You're weird. So you're weird and bossy. But that's who you, And you've always been this way. Even at 10 years old, people would run up to you in the schoolyard and go, I can't find my own work. And you're like, aha, here's what you should do. First, you should do this. Then you should do this. I can't find my beret. Why are you wearing a beret? Never mind. First we'll do this, then we'll do this. That's what you were, even at 10 you were this way. We love, we follow you because you're so pragmatic and opinionated in the face of ambiguity. We love that. Connector. If you're a connector, that doesn't mean you're a networker necessarily. I mean, you may love networking or you may think that other than the word moist, 
Mingle is the worst word in the English language. I don't know. Connectors, though, are always thinking about who can I connect with who? What can I connect with who? What can I connect with what? You think of the world as a series of connections. It's like you've got this metaphorical shopping bag that you carry around with you, putting in new ideas and people so that when we, your followers or colleagues, bump into a brick wall and can't see our way forward, you're the one going, hey, well, uh, have you talked to Brian? We're like, no, I didn't know Brian existed. You're like, yeah, go talk to Brian. He's got the exact problem that you faced only two years ago. He's done it. You're that guy. We follow you because you're resourceful. You don't even know you're that way. Perhaps, but we follow you because we're always the one that you turn to for a new idea, a new person, a new way forward. If you're a creator, your first question in any situation, your first question is always, shh, what do I understand? It's all about my own understanding of how the world works. Let's cut through the clutter and understand the core concepts that can explain why things play out the way they do. You need quiet. You need time. You need time to stop and think, because some of the best conversations you have are with yourself. <laughs> and you know who you are. Right now, you're going, slow down, Marcus. Where did the nine come from? <laughs> Why nine? Was there a tenth? <laughs> what happened to it? You need time. You hate surprises. We follow you. Remember, this is all about leadership. We follow you because you help us make sense of things. You help us make sense of the world, and that sense brings us certainty. E equalizer. If you're an equalizer, your first question is not what is the best thing to do, it's what is the right thing to do. You look at the world and you don't see a bunch of relationships, you see a bunch of commitments made and commitments met. And if somehow some commitment is not met, you don't go, sorry. You go, hey, I'll make it right. I'll make restitution. I'm late for lunch, I'll buy you lunch. I mean, it's not just, sorry, traffic was terrible. It's I've got to make the world right. You bring the world into moral and practical order and we follow you because you do that rarest of things. You do what you say you're gonna do, and you do it again and again and again and again and again. Influencer. If you're an influencer, your first question in any situation is how can I move you to action? How can I move you to action? Every conversation with you is a sale. You don't even know you're doing it. But every conversation, you're trying to figure out how to end the conversation so that at the end, we somehow find that our agenda is now your agenda. Somehow you've, 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 you've jujitsued us into doing exactly what you wanted us to do. We didn't even know how you did it. And some of you do it so subtly. It's not like you're all aggressive and assertive. I mean, some of you might be. But some of you just are sowing goodwill at just the right moments. And three hours later, we're like, I'm going to do something for him. I don't, oh, how did he do that? So you're always thinking about how do we keep the momentum? How do we move toward a better consequence? That's what you're bringing to every situation. You bring momentum. A pioneer. If you're a pioneer, your first question is obviously, what's new? What's next? I mean, right now, if you're a pioneer, you're probably online right now taking this assessment right now in the room on your phone. Or maybe you're taking it in your ear. Who knows? But you're a pioneer. You think of the world as a friendly place. You go, gosh, what's around the corner? I don't know. It's probably good. It's probably great. But the only way we're going to know is if we walk around the corner and see for ourselves, come on, it'll be great. Equalizers are going, shouldn't we have a map? I think we should have a map. Pioneer's like, no, we will make a map out of the bulrushes that we'll surely find by the river in the beautiful land of milk and honey. Come on. By the way, you can have both. I'm not saying these are opposites. This isn't like a Myers-Briggs. You can have pioneer and equalizer as a combination. By the way, pretty darn powerful combination. Provider, if you're a provider, your first question in any situation is, are you okay? Are you okay? I mean, legitimately, I'm looking at each individual on my team and I'm wanting to know where are you at? I mean, emotionally, are you all right? Are you feeling safe? As a provider, you think about making sure that people feel safe enough to share ideas share confidences. It's an incredibly entrepreneurial strength as a leader because you create an environment in which people feel comfortable sharing some new idea and they don't worry you're gonna crush it or sharing a confidence and not worry you're gonna blather it around. People feel so safe to experiment, to try new things, to innovate. That's provider. A couple more since we're toward the end. Here's stimulator. Stimulator, if you're a stimulator, your first thought in any situation is how do I raise the energy? You are just acutely sensitive to the emotional trajectory of anything. A meeting like this, you're aware right now, you might not want to be on stage as a stimulator, but you're aware of the staging. You're aware of how that makes this room feel. If you even sense that the emotion in this room right now is tilted just down, you can't help it. You've sat up more strongly in your seat. Maybe you've made a note a little bit more aggressively in the hopes that the rest of the row is now feeling a little bit more emotionally jacked up. You can't help it. That's what you do. And again, some people have no idea what I'm talking about. And others of you are like, whoa, how did he? 
So all of it, and whether you're stimulated, it's not just a meeting, it's a phone call, it's an email string. You're, you don't need an employee survey to tell you how much engagement is happening on the day. You just walk in and you sense it. Teacher, if you're a teacher leader, we follow you because your first question in any situation is how can you learn? How can you grow? How can I learn? How can I grow? Teacher leaders lead with their questions, always with their questions, because I want to see the world through your perspective, through your point of view. I want to see how you see the world. And I love the fact that everyone's messy. I mean, if I'm a leader, I don't think that there's one size fits all for anything. I follow the mantra as a teacher leader that there's one size fits one. So which one are you? Now, I play this out. You may look at that and go, I've got all of these. Or rather, shouldn't a great leader have all of these? Well, yeah, ideally. But I'm sorry to say that, that this isn't the ideal world. This is you. And, and you're unique and distinct, and, and you've probably got an angle of attack. You may have a bit of all of them. You probably understand all of them. But in terms of why we follow you as a leader, we follow you because you have a distinctive angle of attack, and it's describable, and it's recurring. You, you may grow and develop as a leader, but at 20, you have some patterns of thought and feeling and behavior that are recurring at 82. There's some consider you may grow as a person, but it's not because you've become a different person, it's because you've become a more intelligent version of who you've always been. So here, you're gonna have a couple that really define you. And by the way, if you look at this, you might go, well, I know, I know who I am. I've taken a bunch of these. Uh, I, I kinda know myself. And you might, you might. But I should warn you, if you do take this, and as I said, there'll be keys for everyone to take it if you want to, um, this is not a self-evaluation test. I am not going to give you a, a scale of one to five. Please rate yourself on a bunch of statements on these. This is what's called, for those of you that are geeked out by psychometrics, the, and that's like two of you in the room, um, it, it's called the situational judgment test. I'm going to throw a situation at you, put you under a timer, and then say jump, jump, jump. And for each one of these nine, I'm going to give you 12 chances to jump, and you won't know what I'm measuring. Here's an example. I'm going to say, hey, look, your friend passes your idea off as her own at work. What would you do? What would you do? What would you do? We're all familiar with that situation. What would you do? Would you, uh, would you recognize her need, let her take the credit? Or would you clarify with others that actually it was originally my idea? Or would you say, uh, that, that's wrong. I mean, uh, it's wrong. Or would you say, you know what, I can let that go because I can always come up with another one. Now, none of these are obviously right. You might look at these and go, I wouldn't do any of those. Or you might look at this and go, I would do them all, just in a different order. <laughs> but I'm going to give you a timer, 32 seconds to be precise, and it's not going to be immediately apparent to you which of those nine strength roles these four choices are measuring. I've left it up for more than 32 seconds right now, and it's not immediately obvious to you. And if it is, I'm going to move on. So if it turns out that you get done, and your top two, just to zoom in here, your top two, let's say, let's just, these are my top two as it happens. These are, of course, the best two. Um, <laughs> The joke. Uh, stimulate a creator. If it turns out you are stimulator number one, creator number two, it just means that over the course of that, it takes you about 16 minutes to take. Over the course of those 16 minutes, you kept jumping in a stimulator creatory way and you didn't even know that was what you were doing. And it may turn out to be that you look at those two things and you go, that's me. But it may turn out, it may well turn out that you look at those two and go, I don't know, I, I don't know if those are me. In which case, I would say to you, look, I don't know who the hero is in the narrative that is playing in your head. And it's fine who that hero is. We didn't ask about that hero. We asked what are your repeated recurring behaviors. So when you get your top two, just remember, it may not be how you see yourself. But please, keep your mind open to the possibility that this is how other people see you. This is how you come across to others. This is your impact as a leader. It's what you repeatedly and recurringly do. Now, you can either come across that way to people accidentally, or you can do it intentionally, with purpose. So my hope for Standout in building it was to give leaders a way, not a 360 way, because I think there are methodological problems with 360s, which I want to bore you with, but a, a, a way built on your recurring, natural, unformed, top-of-mind reactions to common scenarios. So when you get your top two and you read the descriptions of what that means for you as a leader, at least stop for a minute and think about whether or not this may well be your unique and distinctive contribution as a leader. Now, some of you may also look at this and go, hey, 
I bet you have to have certain strengths to excel in certain roles as a leader. Are certain of these really leadership strengths and others aren't? You know what, as it turns out, when you actually do the research on this, it turns out if you ask that question of yourself, if you said to yourself, do you have to have certain strengths to excel in a certain job, it turns out you're half right. Because when we give standout to people that are excelling in a very specific kind of role, there is a definable pattern. So for example, we gave this to 80 of the most recently promoted heads of schools in the US. So these are all fantastic principles. And it's not gonna surprise you to know that when you ask the best principles this series of questions and you measure them, their top two strengths are teacher, provider. <laughs> no surprise. I wanna help people learn and grow, and provider says every child, basically every child deserves an education. So yes, there's a pattern, although we did find pioneers and stimulators too. We found every, every one of those nine strengths roles. We asked 45 of the best sales organizations to give us their top two salespeople. And I mean real salespeople, people who have to get a signature on a contract, not like pharmaceutical sales where you're, where you're influencing. You have to actually get a contract, get a contract. So real salespeople, the very best, 90 of them. We gave them this. Again, it's not gonna blow your mind to know that their top two strengths roles are influencer, connector. Connect me to your product, your vision, your mission, and then close me. Don't make, don't, don't make a friend of me, make a sale. Okay, so that's, that makes sense. Again, though, every one of the nine was represented. We gave it to the top 150 Hilton GMs. Now, they got like 15,000 of these people. So this is an incredibly skewed sample, a select group of really, really, really good leaders in the same job in the same company. And yes, there's a pattern. Equalizer, connector, you can see it. My hotel better be clean, it better be safe, it better be a place in which the, I, I know that the key that I get works in the room that you give me. I mean, there's an equalizer part of running a good hotel, and connector simply means I'm out there in the lobby meeting the people that are staying in my hotel and bringing the back of the house to the front. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. And yet, with all of these patterns, guys, whenever you do this research, you start off with a kind of a profile but then you see that there are, in fact, even in this case within Hilton, there were examples of provider leaders, creator leaders. Every one of these nine strengths roles was represented, which suggests that at the extremes of excellence, leadership is unique. At the mediocrity level, all leaders look the same. At the extreme, all leaders look idiosyncratic. In fact, you could probably say that's true of anything. At the extremes of excellence, excellence is unique. You start peeling the onion and calling these people on the phone and going, how do you lead? Because you're not an equalizer connector. You're a, you're a stimulator or you're a provider. Their stories are so vivid but really distinct to one another. Just by way of closing, let me show you a, just, a, just a couple of these because it just blows our mind when you think about generalizing about a role and then you dive into the role and you find there's someone doing it really well that doesn't fit the quote unquote profile. We interviewed somebody called Diana Bernardo. She was a stimulator. One of the very best stimulator though. So you pick up the phone with her and you go, hey, yo, Diana, how'd you do what you do? What's your trick? You're one of the very best out of 15,000. You're one of the top, the extreme excellent deliverers of a fantastic guest experience. What do you do? She goes, I got a mascot. I'm like, what? No, I've got to have a mascot. Everyone should have a mascot. Every hotel should have a, every team should have a mascot. I'm like, really? She goes, yeah. What's yours? Uh, mine's, the, mine's the turtles. We're the Ephrata, Pennsylvania turtles. And you're like, all right, I'm like, uh, why? <laughs> ah, because you don't make any progress as a turtle unless you stick your neck out. And that's us as a team. Oh, we're sticking our neck out. You should see my office, Marcus. It's full of plush turtles. If you're the employee of the month, you're not the employee of the month. Can you guess what you are, Marcus? I'm like, uh, turtle of the, yes, turtle of the month. Marcus, you get a plush turtle, take it home to your kids. Pictures of turtles everywhere. Turtles, every single hotel should have a mascot. And you go, okay, couldn't start her up. She had just idea after idea after idea. Eventually hung up the phone, picked it up, and called uh, Tim. Tim runs the hotel in Times Square. When he took standout, his lead strength role was teacher, and he's quiet, he's self-effacing. You ask him, hey, you go, hey, Tim, how'd you do it? What's your trick? What's your technique? He goes, I don't have anything. It's all my people. My people do all the great work. Which, as a researcher, is just really annoying to hear. <laughs> so you're like, come on, give me a... He's like, no, it's not me. I don't, 
And eventually, after a lot of pushing and pushing, he goes, well, I do have the lending library. I'm like, oh, what's that? He goes, well, I figured if I'm really telling my people that their judgment, their relationships are what matters, then I should say once a week, as a symbol of what's between your ears, bring in a book. Any book, I don't care. Bring in a book and share it with one another. Because that's a symbol of the fact that you're sharing each other's minds, each other's judgment. Share the lending library. And you go, oh, that's a great idea. But imagine if I'd said, but how about also having a mascot? Hey, Tim, what's your mascot? You're the, what are you, the New York Times? Oh, bookworms. Excellent. You're the, book, the bookworms? Oh, that, I went back to Frankenleader again. I hung up the phone, and I called a woman called Melanie Aiken. Melanie was a provider, which very few providers. I mean, not very few, but much less prevalent than equalizers. She was a provider, North Carolina she was from. And after, again, much probing and pushing, she goes, well, one of our techniques, is a lead, one of my leadership tricks, is the paycheck lunch. I'm like, oh, what's that? She goes, well, we spend so much time at the hotel, I figured, why not twice a month we get together in a lunch, and you've got to turn to the person next to you, and you've, you've just got to say one thing you're grateful for. And if you can't think of anything you're grateful for, then pay attention to the next couple of weeks, because you might be sitting next to that person again. And at the end of the lunch, I walk around with the paycheck, and I hand out the paycheck as this, as this physical manifestation of our gratefulness to you. And you hear that, and you go, And then you hang up the phone and you call Steve. Steve's an equalizer. He runs the hotel at Toronto Airport. And Steve is an equalizer. And he goes, my trick, my technique that really works for me is the law of three and two. I follow the law of three and two religiously. If every single hotel GM could follow the law of three and two, then we'd win. And I'm like, oh, fantastic. Uh, what, is, what is it? He goes, aha. Well, you check your guest satisfaction scores three times a day. And whatever you hear, good or bad, you get back to that guest within two hours. Check the guest sat scores three times a day, get back to the guest within two hours. That is the law of three and two, and if every hotel GM could follow that law, we'd win. And you go, okay, okay. I mean, that's obviously what helped you win. But imagine if I said to him again, maybe you could try the, maybe you could try the paycheck lunch. <laughs> I don't want to be a cynic, but I think out of Steve's mouth, the paycheck lunch would sound rather different, don't you? <laughs> I think out of his mouth, it would sound like this. Either you show up to the lunch, or you don't get the paycheck. <laughs> That's the paycheck lunch in Steve's hotel. So the point here, guys, is, of course, when it comes to leadership, remember, at excellence, there is no perfect profile for a leader. Yes, there are perfect outcomes. I shared three of them. But how you get to those outcomes will vary according to each of you. There's no perfect profile. There are only perfect practices that fit your profile. So if you want to figure out what your particular profile is, then yes, I would encourage you, whether it's through self-reflection or through taking something like Stand Out, figure out what is your greatest value that you as a leader bring to the team. What are your top two? And if it turns out you're top two a pioneer influencer, that's not right. That's not good. Those aren't the two leadership ones. There's nothing necessarily good about any top two combination. When you take something like this, the point for you is not to try to discover what is unique about you. No. The point, as ever, from a servant leadership standpoint, the point is to figure out how to take what is unique about you and make it useful. And I hope in my short time today with you, I've been able to give you one piece of data, and in this case, one tool, to help you step up and meet that challenge. Thank you very much.